Welcome to the Politocrat. I'm Omar Moore. It is Thursday, April the 22nd, 2021. On this edition of the Politocrat, today is Come Back Down to Earth Day. The reality of what has transpired these last 24 to 48 hours. Bless you for your grace and your dignity, for the model that you are, for appealing for justice in the most dignified way. They are in search of justice then, uh, and now, now they see this giant step. But as our colleagues have said, it's not over. They complimented the Congressional Black Caucus for its role that it has played in all of this. They're eager to see Karen Bass's uh, George Floyd Justice and Policing Act passed and, and signed by the president into law. All of them... Well, for one, she's you know, become a star. Uh, uh, Rodney and Terrence, his, the brothers, Bridget is, is their sister. Uh, we all know Ketta, who's the force of nature within the family. But Gianna, the little, his daughter, Gianna, to see this justice on behalf of her father. His name synonymous with justice and dignity and grace and prayerfulness and prayerfulness. So we thank God. We thank Jesus. Because we were praying to him all along. Right, Donna? We thank God. They are people of faith. They conveyed that to me on the phone, but they've conveyed it all along. So as it uh, be eight weeks, according to what the judge said, on this, before we know the sentencing, but that's part of the justice of it all as well. Mr. Kyburn has been a solid, study, steady force for all of us here because this, is very, this was a, a traumatic. My little granddaughter, who just turned 12, she said, why is it taking so long? It didn't take that long, but we all saw it on TV. We saw it happen. And thank God the jury validated what we saw what we saw so again thank you george floyd for sacrificing your life for justice for being there to call out to your mom how how heartbreaking was that call out for your mom i can't breathe but because of you and because of thousands millions of people around the world who came out for justice your name will always be synonymous with justice Dear, oh dear, oh dear. Speaker Pelosi, that's, that's, you know, you've really got to. <sighs> Speaker Pelosi, please. This really is not only embarrassing, it's disgraceful. And I don't want to hear it. Well, she misspoke and she made a mistake and... Oh, my goodness, she's 80-something years old. Well, if you think that age is the issue, right, then why don't you tell her that the speaker's chair should be occupied by someone else? If some of you are going to say, well, look, she's an old lady, you know, because that's what's going to happen, isn't it? I'm going to get some message or email or something with someone saying to me, well, why are you going at Speaker Pelosi? She is 80-something years old. So what if she's 80-something? They're 80-something-year-olds who don't say insensitive garbage like that. Oh, please. Oh, please. See, this is the thing that gets me, right? Before I even get into talking about what I want to talk about on this episode. But what gets me is, all of a sudden... You have, and I talked about this in the episode yesterday when it came to Makia Bryant and how I was saying that the family has a right to 
contextualize and define her. But the rest of us, we tend to do this thing with black people who are murdered by police or by some white mob as what I call credentialing the dead. Where you have to say, oh, well, they were this, they were that, they were loved, they were this. And, I, and I'm like, what if they weren't loved? That doesn't make them any less human. And that doesn't make them any less of a person. I don't care who they were. No human being deserves to be shot down dead like 16-year-old Makia Bryant was. No human being deserves to be tortured and lynched like Emmett Till was, like George Floyd was. That's the issue. Not whether they were nice and kind or were very good in school, were lawyers, were doctors. That's not the test, but that's what this society does. We get involved in this. We have to polish them up after, they're, after they've had bullet holes in them. We now have to kind of rejuvenate these individuals somehow. I mean, part of that is because you've got a racist society and a fair number of racist white people out there demonizing George Floyd or demonizing Makia Bryant or demonizing any other of the thousands of black, uh, black people who have been shot dead by police. So I think some of that, and I didn't talk about this yesterday, some of that is reflexive to what this racist system does, anti-black system, and people who are anti-black and racist who do these kinds of things. So that's what the response is, to try to say all these, oh, they were great people. What if they weren't great people? It doesn't matter in my eyes. It's what matters is, that this should not be continuing where black people are walking the street and some cop comes up to them and blows them away. That is not a civilized society. It's not a just society. And despite one verdict, this is still a an unjust society. All this credentialing we're doing, but when Speaker Pelosi says something like what you just heard there, oh, some people are, oh, Back off of her. She's older. She's this. She's that. So she gets to say whatever the heck she wants to say, whether she slipped up, effed up, said it deliberately or not, gets carried away, says something deliberately and hurtful or not. But when the 16-year-old black girl gets killed, you have to come out there and talk about, oh, she was this, she was that, she was the other. She's 16. She's 16. She's a child. Doesn't matter what she was. She's a child. She's a human being. And if we had a value system in this country that looked at people as the human beings that they are, with their ups, their downs, their frailties, their hopes, their dreams, their fears, their great moments, their not so great moments, Instead of throwing numbers and credentials at them and viewing them through what a dominant racist white society and system says that you must view someone as and view their value as. Oh, their GPA was 5.2. I know I'm exaggerating. Four point whatever. Oh, they, you know, they did this. They did that. What about the kind of people they are? But even so, value someone's humanity first. Not whether they went to Harvard or Howard or Morehouse or any of the... I mean, it's great to go to Morehouse and Harvard and Howard. All great schools. But again, that's how this society is. It's like what James Baldwin keeps saying. And I keep t quoting it. It's like the first time, I think, in the last couple of days that I've actively quoted him. Although I've been playing audio clips of him. You don't need numbers. You need passion. And that is true of the history of the world. And James Baldwin was correct and is correct. If there wasn't passion out on these streets, you wouldn't be hearing about Makia Bryant. You wouldn't be hearing about George Floyd, about Dante Wright, about Adam, Adam Toledo. If people were in Chicago right now and, and for weeks before, 
in the streets. You wouldn't have heard about Adam Toledo. Toledo, excuse me. You wouldn't have heard about him. So again, I, I pardon me here for even before getting into today's episode, um, but I've got I had to address that. That was that audio you heard from Speaker Pelosi was on Tuesday. Um, I believe it was uh, on the on the you know on Capitol Hill. You had members of the Congressional Black Caucus standing behind her as she said that garbage you heard. Thank you, George, for sacrificing your life for justice. I mean, how how brain dead is a statement like that? How insensitive is a statement like that? And I know someone's going to be out there going, well, she meant it in this way. What If you've got to start talking about what someone else meant, that means they've already effed up. Because a person should speak and you should know exactly what it is they're saying unless they're completely unclear. And there was nothing unclear about what Speaker Pelosi said. Can you imagine, God forbid, she loses one of her daughters who is presently with us and someone comes up to her and says, well, thank you for your daughter for sacrifice. Thanks to your daughter for sacrificing her life for justice. How do you think Speaker Pelosi would feel? How would you feel if you had a child and that child, God forbid, was taken from you? By some killer cop, by some illness, by some, you know, some person committing a crime and some public official comes up to you and says to you, oh, thank you for sacrificing your your child, sacrificing their life for justice. You wouldn't be too happy about that, I'm sure. Maybe you would be happy. I don't want to be presumptuous, but I wouldn't be. If, if I had, if that scenario applied to me in some way, I wouldn't be happy. Would you? Would you? Would you be happy about that? Or maybe your point is, well, it's not a question of being happy, Omar. It's people, these politicians make these statements and some of them get carried away. They don't think about what they're saying before they open their mouths and say it. And then they, or they're just malicious. Take your pick. And for someone like Speaker Pelosi to say what she said there, don't thank George Floyd. He didn't sacrifice his life for justice. He was pinned down on the asphalt for nearly 10 minutes with his hands behind his back, cuffed, two officers holding him down, a third officer, the one that got convicted two days ago, sitting on him for nearly 10 minutes with his knee in the neck of George Floyd. George Floyd didn't sacrifice his life for justice. What are you talking about, Speaker Pelosi? You're embarrassing. You are embarrassing. You're embarrassing yourself. You're embarrassing everyone around you. You're embarrassing all of us here in San Francisco, California. I mean, I didn't vote for you this past time. But for those who did, unless they don't care either and will defend every single thing you do, it's embarrassing. got congressional black caucus there behind her nodding and they must have been cringing inside but you see they won't challenge speaker pelosi because speaker pelosi's got lots of power it's called entrenched power and so she's been in that staple for such a duration now that she's become an institution and you don't challenge that kind of power because she's a powerful politician and she knows how to negotiate. She's a good negotiator. Now, some people will chuckle and laugh at that for lots of reasons, like a lot of the stimulus bill prior to the general election of 2020. And I can understand why people would scoff at that. 
But Speaker Pelosi wouldn't get to, and I know she got a fortune from da da da. I get it, I get it, I get it. A billionaire husband or whatever, da 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 da. But Speaker Pelosi wouldn't have climbed the ladder in terms of politics if she didn't have some kind of political acumen. But this is embarrassing. It's not the first time she's put her foot in her mouth. And she's not the only politician who has and is not going to be the last politician to do so. Now, listen, that's an excerpt of what she said, what you just heard. And I don't know what else she said before or after that. Speaking of context, context is important. No, not the Eric Nelson look at the 16 minutes before the nine and a half minutes to the jury appeal context. Not that. I'm talking about the context of here are the circumstances and here is and are the parameters of what was said. But even so, any way you slice it, those two plus minutes that you just heard a few minutes back of Speaker Pelosi on Tuesday after this verdict was announced, this is really bad. Not Nothing in there about, I'm sorry for the family's loss. And she may have said that. I know she's spoken to the family. So I would imagine that in private conversations, as she indicated, in phone conversations with the family, I'm sure she has said those kinds of things. I'd be shocked if she didn't. But to then come out publicly and make an ass of yourself, it's embarrassing. I know there's a lot of... Uh, Speaker Pelosi fans out here. And, you know, as I've said before, I've voted for her at times and there have been elections like the last two or three where I haven't because there's some really good reasons why I haven't. Well, you're criticizing for every little thing someone says and, oh, you should just give him a break. No, I'm not cutting anybody a break. It's embarrassing. This has happened so many times. It's not just Speaker Pelosi. It's all these politicians. Democratic ones, Republican ones, and they say these things. And I get people say things. I've said things. You've said things. We've said things. But my goodness me, come on. You can't do that to the family of George Floyd. That's really unfair. I know life ain't fair. Just talk to George Floyd's family about that. But my goodness me, come on. You can't be saying stuff like that. Oh dear, oh dear. Yes, I am making a deal of it. Because it's a deal that should be made of. And you should say something about that. When I saw that clip yesterday and I wasn't going to put it in yesterday's episode I, I felt you know we need to have a little bit of um, you need to just speak about what happened on Tuesday and what happened to Makia Brand that's what we need to talk about but my goodness me you know this is just and I know that Speaker Pelosi got a lot of I didn't read it, but I imagine she got absolutely taken to the woodshed and some people were very abusive. Look, I'm not going to sit here and be abusive. That's not the thing. Now, come on. You can take her to task. I can take her to task. People who see the need to take her to task should do so. But my goodness me, um, abuse, no. We don't need any of that here. You know? I mean, I, I mean yes, I curse out some of these people. But I'm not going to engage in any kind of garbage on social media and any of this kind of vitriolic talk and abusive talk about Speaker Pelosi. I made it clear on Twitter that, you know, what are you doing? WTF? Question mark. SMH. I think that's enough. I don't have to start personally demonizing Speaker Pelosi. That's not what that's about. She knows that she made a mistake there. Now, I don't know if she's come out and said anything subsequent. I've not looked. But maybe she hasn't. Maybe she has. But she got the message. Her people got the message. Trust me. They know. 
and she knows and she's heard. So I don't have to know that for a fact to know that, come on, the people who run her social media accounts, believe me, they don't just sit there like automatons. They are human beings, right? They do speak to people in the communications department for Speaker Pelosi. And that gets back to the speaker. It just does. So, come on. I don't have to actually be... Pre- That's how this works. Just like when all these companies do things on social media and say these outrageous and heinous things, and then the social media community lets them know about it, and boom, the social media account people consult, obviously, with the people who are making the decisions at these companies, and then they craft a statement, and then that social media person gets the finished statement from whomever's crafting it, and then puts it on Twitter. We apologize for da-da-da. That's how this works. It's not rocket science. I'm not telling people anything that is shockingly earth-shattering. Please do not ever talk to us as black people and thank us for sacrificing for justice. There is so much wrong with that comment. Sacrificing our lives for justice. When you know there's so much wrong with what you've said and there's so much wrong with the content of it and you know that justice does not exist for black people in the United States of America. And one verdict is not justice. It's accountability. That is exactly right. That's why I played that 14 minutes or 13 minutes from Attorney General of Minnesota, Keith Ellison, on Tuesday, in this Tuesday episode of this podcast. Because he's correct. And yes, I said justice, but a modicum of it, but it's really accountability. Justice is to make sure that not only, well, look, I think justice is making sure he comes back, George Floyd. But of course, we know the world and human physiology doesn't work that way. Right? That's true justice. Having George Floyd in the world would be true true justice. Right? But we know that once you're killed, that's it. As Malcolm X said, you are six feet under. You are in the ground. You are done. You are gone. So, yeah, so since that's not going to happen where George Floyd appears again, right? The next best justice, if you will, short of George Floyd reappearing and being alive in this world, which of course is not going to happen, would be to get rid of all of these police who do these things. Get them out of the forces. And Merrick Garland announcing yesterday the investigation into the Minneapolis police is a nice start, but there's so many other police departments. Which means all of this is systemic, folks. This isn't about a cop here, a cop there. This is about a system that continues to have cops like this on its force, like a Derek Chauvin, who, with 18 or 19 complaints, was allowed to continue on on the force. And it's kind of hypocritical to see the police chief of Minneapolis and all these other people testifying against Chauvin when the system itself that governs and people in that police department made decisions to keep Derek Chauvin on that force for that long. And let's not lionize these police. Yes, it was good that they came forward. And yes, that is the definition of a good cop for me is testifying against a bad one. But how difficult would it have been to do that, please? There's a videotape out here that the world has seen billions of times. How difficult would it have been? It would have been very easy, I think, for those police officials to testify. When the whole world marched for months last year and demonstrations are going all over the world and still now going on here in the United States, all over the country, how difficult is it for a I'm not trying to minimize anything. I'm just saying to you, dear listener, how difficult would that have been for those police? I don't think it would have been that hard. 
Now, if there was no video of this, do you think those police officers and that police chief in Minneapolis would have testified? With Derek Chauvin sitting 25, 30 feet from them, do you think they would have testified? If there were no videotape, uh, no video recording of this murder, if there were no marchings, no protests in Minneapolis or anywhere in the world, do you think that those police officials would have testified against Derek Chauvin? Welcome back. And here we are. And I hope you're well on this Thursday, April 22nd, 2021. Welcome to the Politocrat Daily Podcast, as always. Um, Again, I do hope that you are well and that you have been vaccinated or that you are in the process of getting a vaccination. Remember to please, please get one um, from this horrible virus, COVID-19. It is wreaking havoc still. This virus is. Do not be fooled. Do not be fooled. Um, There are still places around the world that are stricken and ravished by this virus. India in particular. Its cases are skyrocketing in the second most populous nation on earth. I mean, this should be definitely cause for concern. And again, I know there are people who disagree with what I've said about this in the past, but I I am, you know, I just don't, I'm not with this showcasing my, uh, you know, I'm not just not with this showcasing of, of my vaccine shot, you know, ooh, that's just something that is to me uniquely American, right? Why do we do that kind of thing? You know, why? I don't see... Well, I could be wrong. I, 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 well, I haven't seen it. Maybe you have. I don't see people in other countries, by and large, going on social media and showing... I mean, uh, then I need to go look at some more social media, don't I? I need to spend... I don't have that time to be spending looking on social media for all of the, the people who do this. It should be obvious to you if it's there, but, you know, for the... Small amount of time I spend on social media, and you really shouldn't, in my view, be spending more than an hour or two a day, if that, on social media. I mean, even an hour, even two hours is actually a, probably a little bit too long. But people spend hours a day on social media for whatever reason. Sometimes there's very good reasons why, and then there are other reasons that maybe not so good reasons. Uh, I just don't think it's healthy um, to be on social media for more than an hour or two a day. I really don't. I really don't. Um, and if you're on social media for more than two hours in a day, in my humble opinion, and I'm no doctor, I'm no psychologist, I'm just offering an opinion. <laughs> and everybody has one of those. But my whole thing is, if you are on social media for more than two hours on a daily basis... That's way too much time to be on social media. I mean, really, it's way too much time. And I get it. You can be online and you can be reading stories. You could be doing I get that's a different thing. But I mean, on Facebook, on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, whatever it is. Right. If you're on that for more than two hours during the day, and I'm not even talking about just two hours straight. I'm talking about just two hours of a day doing that. On social media? Mm -mm. No. Not healthy. I just don't think that's healthy. But again, there's reasons why there are people who do it. And there are people who do it for the reasons that they do it for. And who am I to say? I just uh, just, am not a fan of this parading around, oh, I got my shot. Knowing, knowing, knowing that there's 90% of the world that doesn't have a shot. And probably will never, ever be able to get one. Not because they don't want one, but because of all the politics and all the racism and all the vaccine. It's not vaccine nationalism, it's vaccine racism, you know, and all of that. So you've got a lot of black and brown countries 
who will never get this vaccine or 90% of their populations will never receive a vaccination. Not because they don't want one, but because of the resources and because of countries like ours and the United States and countries like the UK stockpiling all this vaccine and holding companies and countries at ransom, to ransom over it. And I know they're organizing, I keep talking about COVAX and all that, but again, this is, this is where it's going, right? And the African continent, much of it, with the exceptions of South, I think the South Africa and maybe one, one other African country, they don't have the vaccine. They require anyone that walks in to the African continent to be fully vaccinated and have documentation showing it. You know, I, I, it's, I don't know. I just think, again, people have the right to do it. And like I say, I support, I know this is really odd, right? I support someone's right to do that. If they want to go on social media and do that. And yes, on the one hand, it's a, an ed- educational service, particularly whether it's celebrity dim or not. It, it, there's an education around that. I get that, that you may be doing that to educate others and encourage them, which I understand fully. Oh, it's okay. Don't worry. I get that standpoint. I'm not attacking that. I'm just saying it's part of this culture that we have here that we've got to showcase everything all the damn time. And social media is part of that. But I think this preceded social media. We've got to showcase every single thing. You know, nothing can be private anymore. And like it's a me- like as if it's a requirement that you've got to put this out there. No, it's not a requirement. Anyway, that's me going off and, and ranting here. <laughs> oh, dearie, dearie, dearie. Um, all of that is to say, please get vaccinated. We, we just need to have people do that. Um, this virus is not going to go anywhere if people don't, enough people do not get vaccinated. I mean, we really do need something like 80 to 85 percent. Some people say 75 percent, but it's higher. It's 80 to 85 percent of the population, seriously, in the United States, but also in each of these other countries. It's not going to work otherwise if we only have, say, 70, 70 percent of the population of these countries doing this. It's got to be higher. If we really want to push this virus underground, we have to do that. We have to get vaccinated. Here's the other thing. There are more variants coming up. And have been spreading in India and in, in, in Brazil has been a real issue. Here in California, you've got um, variants popping up. You've got people being uh, coming down with this virus. And I get it. California's right now, if you read the Washington Post, I believe, um, as of yesterday or today, um, California's rate is the second lowest in the country now for COVID-19. Hawaii is the number one state, the lowest rate of, um, I think, deaths and cases. Same thing with California it is number two. And that's all good. That's a great accomplishment to know that this great state of California is number two in the country. So, there we go. You know, that, 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 that's just something that we please, we need to get vaccinated. A lot of other things to get to before I get back to what's going on here and the system and everything and what we need to do. Um, Vanessa Guillen, justice for Vanessa. Guillen. Vanessa Guillen was a private at Fort Hood in the United States Army. Uh, Fort Hood is an army base in Killeen, Texas, and or I believe in Killeen, Texas, thereabouts in Fort Hood, Texas. And, uh, you know, this is really important um, to keep her name alive. Um, Myra Guillen has, um, is, 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 is her sister. And on Twitter, she's at M G U I. L-E-N. 
underscore. Uh, please follow her and send her some support. Uh, apparently, um, this day, uh, on this very sad day, um, just a year ago now, Vanessa Guillen was murdered uh, it, it, on the base, on the base, and by um, a fellow private who ended up using a gun to end his own life. So, you know, this is a really horrible day for the Guillen family. And, you know, there needs to be a full investigation. I know there's been hearings in Congress over the last year, but we need to keep Vanessa Guillen's name alive as well. You know, there's a lot of people's names, including hers. We must keep her name out there. Vanessa Guillen. Um, justice for Vanessa again, and we must keep pushing for that. We must keep pushing for that. You know, there have been something like thirty some odd, if not more, Latinx um, people who have who are privates and people in the army who have been killed at Fort Hood over the last year or two or so. Horrendous. It's horrendous. And the U.S. Army is not doing a whole heck of a lot about it. So we need to definitely keep Vanessa Guillen's name alive. It was so brutal. She was victimized constantly by male privates in the U.S. Army at Fort Hood, where there's been a whole lot of violence against military people by other military people. It's just been so horrible. And what happened to Vanessa Guillen was was just evil. It was repugnant. It was evil. It's just, I've I've spoken about this in an episode probably almost a year ago now. It was around the time that this happened or maybe a few weeks after or a few months after. Probably a few months after. But you can search... Wherever you're listening to this from, you can go online and search Vanessa Guillen. Um, Vanessa, the common spelling of the of the name Vanessa, and then her last name, G-U-I-L-L-E-N. Vanessa Guillen, G-U-I-L-L-E-N, as in Nancy. And you can search for that episode. I, I did um, an episode, or maybe even two, on her. Um, and spoke about her and spoke about everything. It was just horrible. And I support the Guillen family a thousand percent. So, again, a lot's going on. I'm going to get to some other things going on and mention them in a, in a little bit. But I want to get to the system. And I think what happened on Tuesday with this verdict is that and I said this before to an extent, but not much of what I said. I just mentioned in the uh, Tuesday episode, and I think also yesterday episode this week, that there's this tendency in the dominant culture, the white culture, um, in this society, to excessively cheerlead one exception and exalt it beyond all others. But then go back to sleep until Nakia Brown gets killed. Or as it did happen yesterday in Elizabeth City, North Carolina. A man by the name of, and this is just, again, this just continues, doesn't it? A man by the name of Andrew Brown gets killed, a brother, in North Carolina. Sheriff's deputy shot him eight times. He was driving away in his vehicle. And this sheriff's deputy fires eight rounds into him as he's driving away. Now, haven't you heard of backup? This is what I keep saying to these white cops who do this. 
Because it is mostly white cops who do this. And any cop that does this needs to be in prison. I don't care um, who does it. But it is a disproportionate number of white cops. Female and male. Mostly male. But the point I make is... Haven't you heard of backup? Haven't you heard of that? Why do you... When it comes to us, rhetorical question, rhetorical question. Think that the best way to effectuate a resolution to a situation in front of you is to kill one of us. Why do you think that's the most time efficient way or effective way to do something? If you're a cop and if you're a white cop, why do you think that blasting someone away is something of training and if that is training that's wrong why is a police department training people like that let's say that that's what was the training why are they training people to do that and if they are training people to do that why is it that it's only black people who are getting that kind of training right the end result of that training is the bullets in the chest of makia wright Excuse me, McCre- yeah, interchange. I could, yeah, they're all interchangeable, right? The names, Makia Brand, Dante Wright, Andrew Brown, right? I could go through all of these names, and I may mix up the names, right? You know, I could, I could totally because these are all inter- interchangeable, right? This is, my question is, if this is the training, why is the training only applied to black people that you in, encounter? If you're telling me that, well, we, we do this and we, we decide that we've, we can't resolve the conflict better than we ha- by, than by killing someone. That's the way we do it here. How come you don't do that with white people who come up to you with guns and knives? Come up to you with knives, rather. Come up to you with axes. I've seen, I'm telling you this, dear listener, because I've actually seen these videos. And these are not fake. They're not staged. They're actual videos. And they're not actors for those freaks out there who tell me, oh, or who tell the world, oh, Sandy Hook was staged. No, it's not staged. Sandy Hook was not staged. It takes a special kind of evil not a special kind, a really unholy evil for people to be telling the parents of the kids whose faces have been shot off that it didn't really happen and these are dummies and these are not real people here. These were dummies and mannequins planted on the, on the floor and it was staged and it was part of a production. That takes a special kind of depravity. That takes depravity. That takes someone without a soul. And there's a lot of people walking around here without souls, believe me. They think they have souls, but they're not very soulful people. But that training is not applied to everybody. And why would you want to have a training manual that says, kill someone to resolve the conflict? And at the same time, you're telling people who are in gangs, we shouldn't resort to being in gangs because killing someone to resolve a conflict is never a good idea. So the hypocrisy just stinks, doesn't it? So on the one hand, you're supposed, and I don't believe this for a second, that there's any training manual that says you should go and blow away someone who's black to resolve a conflict. You just do it as practice because you've been doing it that way for 400 years and it's part of a system. And at the same time, you're doing that to resolve what you see as an issue. And sometimes there's no conflict at all. Often there's no conflict. You just do it to get your rocks off. I bagged me a black person today. That's the mentality of of not just these cops, the system. 
But at the same time, you're telling someone who has been trapped and oppressed by that system and whose family structure has been ripped apart by enslavement, ripped apart by police to begin with. And so they're out here with no belonging and they go to some gang, whether you and I like that or not, and have some kind of community within a gang. And all of a sudden you're telling that person who probably lost a parent to a police bullet or bullets. Right. Who's who the system has ravaged with all of its rules and its oppression. And you're telling that person, you know, it's not a good idea to resolve conflicts with violence. And it's a shame that you have to do that because in gangs, your initiation is to go and do that. Well, what about the police gangs? Of KKK and all kinds of people who go into these police departments who are military people who are disgraced from the military or leave the military and they become police or the militarization of police and that gang mentality. How about the gang of cops that held down George Floyd? How about the gang of cops that beat Rodney King to within an inch of his life? What about them as a gang? What about the gang of cops in Buffalo, New York? who pushed down that old white man and were telling people, don't help him up. What about the gang of cops in Buffalo who back in 2016 were trying to kill a handcuffed man, a handcuffed brother, choke, trying to choke the life out of him, a la George Floyd. And if it wasn't for Carriol Horn, a fellow cop, pulling a white cop off of this man, you would have had another person killed. If it wasn't for Carriol Horn beating the life, beating the daylights out of this other cop. So it's just evil, but this is part of a system. You know, New York, New York Times here. And you may be able to hear that plane flying in the sky. New York Times from yesterday, I actually had this because I wanted to, again, I'm no fan of the Times in any real way. Um, I've said that to you many times. I, 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 I wanted to buy this one, though, yesterday just to get the memorialization of what the paper of record, so-called, how it presents its look at what happened in the verdict on Tuesday. And there's a full page story in the national section from Wednesday yesterday by Aidan Gardner and Rebecca Halleck. I'm sure it's online as well, but on in the newspaper here, there's something particularly striking about the way the columns are set up and how it looks. So they put They've put 19 cases here, 19 people, black people, who were killed by police. And then the title of the article, this is just 19. This is not 90 or 990 or 9,090 or 90,090. Or 900,090. This is just 19 people. Title of the article, Fewer Charges, Fewer Convictions, A Grim History of Police Violence. And what they've done is they've characterized this in different sections. Trials avoided. That's one section. Charges are rare. That's another section. Video evidence is another section. The heat of the moment is another section. Armed or not is another section. Drug use, another section. Other officers' testimony, another section. A deadlocked jury, another section. So there's all these sections of cases where black people are being killed. This is just 19 cases. All of them within the last seven years. 
Actually, there was one of them that's in 2006 and one of them in 2009, so it's a bit longer than that. But the bulk of these have come within the last seven years, and many of them during President Obama's administration. In fact, the bulk of them ha- happened during President Obama's administration, which, is, which tells you something, I guess, or maybe not. And of these ones that they've put down, only three of them happened during the previous administration to Joe Biden's. And the names are here. I'm going to just read out the names. And so they do, and I think it's a good, it's a good article. Sandra Bland, Freddie Gray, Eric Garner, Michael Brown, Tamir Rice, Stephon Clark, Breonna Taylor, Oscar Grant III, Walter Scott, John Crawford III, Silville K. Smith, Sean Bell, Akai Gurley, Terence Crutcher, Daniel Prude, Laquan McDonald, Philando Castile, Samuel DeBose, Damon Grimes. Now, some of those names are very familiar to you. Others may not be as familiar. I've talked about a number of these individuals who are no longer with us. I've mentioned their names, spoken about them, and I will continue to do so. I do think that this article is a good one. Fewer charges, fewer convictions, a grim history of police violence. But what this article doesn't really go into, it's more just presenting these cases and what the juries did or didn't do or whether these cases even got to juries. And they go through that very well here. And they give you, excuse me, they give you, um, pardon me there, um, they give you um, a, a good I think, a fairly good view of what happened. But what's missing is the systemic discussion, the discussion of the system and how it is not doing for black people what it does for white people. How it's not doing that. And that's by design. This is all systemic. And as I said earlier, these police officers testifying against Derek Chauvin It's not impressive to me. I mean, yes, I'm happy that they did testify because there'd be police who still wouldn't testify because there's the blue wall of silence. And so they're not going to go anywhere near. And while I say great, great thank you for actually testifying, to call them, as I'm sure some people are out there, and I've heard this too, to call them courageous no, there's no courage there. I think they're, I think police who do testify against other police are good police in that way. But they're not courageous. Come on. This video had been circulating for almost a year now. You know? And the, conde- the condemnation around the globe was so vast and thorough. So thorough. We heard from world leaders. I mean, are you kidding me? We heard from world leaders. So, come on. I mean, politicians all over the world have talked about George Floyd. Are you kidding me? So, I mean, it, you got, I'm serious. Prime ministers, presidents. You've had people in, in, in the, you know, and members of parliaments talking about George Floyd. So, I'm sorry. Some police doing that now. Testifying against A murderer is hardly a badge of courage. I tell you what is a badge of courage. Darnella Frazier, she is a badge of courage. You know, these folks who are from the community testifying with a killer sitting 30 feet from them, that's courageous. Darnella Frazier testifying, that's courageous. Knowing what we know about people who testify. How many times we talked about this? There was a young brother who in 2019 testified at the trial of Amber Geiger, I believe it was. Amber Geiger is the white female police officer in Dallas who burst into Botham Jean's home and shot him at point-blank range three times in his, in his stomach, in his chest. It's just so evil. You know how frightening that is? You're in your own apartment at night 
It doesn't matter when it is. You're in your own apartment. And even that is not good enough. It's not safe enough for you. Because you've got some killer cop. Breonna Taylor. Sleeping the most safest thing you can do. Right? In your apartment. And you can be so vulnerable in that position. Because you may never wake up again. From natural causes. No matter what. Right? But for a 26 year old. Or anyone. To be in her own bed, in her own bed, how is the most, and then you never wake up because bullets have been hitting you in your sleep, killing you almost instantly, instantly. And so you've got people testifying against Amber Geiger at trial, like this one brother, Forget his name now, Jamal or Joshua or whomever. I don't remember his name. And forgive me for getting his name wrong. This is off the top of my head. And that brother bravely testified against her with her sitting, Geiger sitting right there. Like Derek Chauvin, Amber Geiger had a history and she was also a racist. Posting things on social media that were racist and offensive and saying anti-black things and, you know, racist things. This is about a system, folks. And this brother testified, he was probably 18 or 17 or 19, and whatever, he was a teenager. Or thereabouts, I think he was. He testified against her and a week later, he was shot, dead. Shot in his mouth. So what is that about, folks? What do you think that is? Shot in his mouth. That is a message being sent. Don't testify against a cop. That's what that is. That brother was murdered. And how would anybody have known his address? How did that get filtered out? What do you think that was? You don't think that someone slipped an address? You don't think someone in that courtroom, in that courthouse, in that structure, slipped the police the address of this young brother? Come on now. That's what is courage, right? The courageous thing is someone going in and testifying, knowing that they could be killed. And that's exactly what happened. He was murdered. Don't ever forget that brother, by the way. I'm going to try to see if I can get dig up his name in the break. I shouldn't say it like that. I, I'm going to try to get his name in the break for you. Because that, that, that's a guy that should still be here. And we don't need uh, anybody, Speaker Pelosi, thanking him for sacrificing for justice. This is not... The kind of thing you should be saying. And in a civilized society, we wouldn't be saying things like this. And this is what this is. And this is the system, right? The whole point here for me in this segment is to talk about how the system's been let off the hook with this verdict. I'll tell you why. The, The culture, as I've alluded to earlier, loves to exalt one moment where something finally goes right because black folk and activists on the street have been fighting for it for a whole year right and the evidence is right in your face and we and some of us some people in the world are jumping up and down but i was i told you i was sad i mean i was happy that the jury came up with the only verdict that they really had to come up with I never thought that they were ever going to do this. I was happy to be wrong. I was happy that the verdict came out as as it did. I wanted first degree manslaughter, so did many of you. That didn't happen. But the fact of the matter is this guy could still face a lot of prison time. But, but, as I alluded to yesterday, don't celebrate anything. We've got all these other cases out of here that we've got to look at. 
This doesn't just stop now. And and again, oh, President Biden, oh, this is this could be a substantial step. It's a step. It's one verdict. The whole system still does what it's doing to us as black folk. This ain't just, oh, this could could it be? Well, if it's a, if it's a substantial or significant step to you, Mr. President, then make sure we get all of these killer cops out of these police departments and get rid of this system and put in a system that recognizes and respects the humanity of black people. Really? It's just... It's not a substantial step. I mean, the videotape was as plain as day. The prosecution had to work damn hard to get this. We had to. You had to. If you were in the street or if you're on social media and you're making it clear that Black Lives Matter and you actually are at least opening your mouth or opening your tweets and you're writing these things, it's a step. It's a start. It's important. It's better than pretending that this world does not exist around you. There are people on social media who never talk about George Floyd or be on a tail and never send a tweet out. They do what they do. So if their thing is film, some of the people who do that will never refer to anything in the real world that's going on around them. They might, but some of them won't. Or in any, I don't want to pick on film because I'm part of film too either. Well, I'm a film critic. I'm not part of film. I'm someone who writes about it from time to time. I would love to do more. I'm just... You know, it's just, I will, I promise, I will. For those who are film lovers in particular, I will get back to a lot of that, believe me. Um, But, you know, there's some people who never talk about these things, never talk about what's going on in other countries, what's going on in other places. They just completely shut off. Right? But this is not a substantial step. This is the system saying to itself, patting itself on the back. And the system in this trial of Derek Chauvin isolated someone. That's what it did. I liken it to when you isolate someone in the mob and you're ready to bump them off. Not that they were ready to bump off Derek Chauvin. I'm not saying that. But there was all this isolation, and rightly so, right? But... Even in the closing arguments from the prosecution, well, this is not the Minnesota, the state of Minnesota against the police. It's the state of Minnesota against Derek Chauvin. Except they didn't say Chauvin; they said against the defendant. I think well, they said both. But I thought that was effective. But it also, it was also telling at the very same time as it was effective. One, it isolated, rightfully so, this defendant. But two. It reaffirmed the system. The notion that, oh, it's not the state of Minnesota against the police. And there's something to be said about that because this system of policing continues in Minnesota because while this trial was going on, Kim Potter took it upon herself to murder Dante Wright in Brooklyn Center, Minnesota. Literally about a 10 to 15 minute drive or so away from where that courthouse is in Hennepin County. And so even when this trial was going on, you've got police in Minneapolis and in in Brooklyn Center killing black people. And again, it's it's again, it's the system. And you've got the defense attorney. Well, the events that have happened lately and people are upset. Oh, like we shouldn't be upset that a 20-year-old boy has been murdered by a 26-year veteran of the force who somehow now doesn't know the difference between a gun and a taser. 26 years on the force and you don't know the difference. You're a former police union president and you don't know the difference between a gun and a taser. You know the difference between a black person and a white person though, don't you? Come on now. 
You've, I mean, come on. This is why Kim Potter is dirt, just like the rest of these cops, these killer cops. You haven't had to use a, t- uh, you haven't had any mix up when you've arrested a white person, if you have. In your 26 years on the force, Kim Potter, you've not had some crisis of confusion. Ooh, I'm not sure which one's the red wire and which one's the blue wire. I don't know. Which one's the gun and which one's the taser? My Monday pills, my Tuesday pills, my Wednesday pills. Which ones do I take on Thursday? Oh, I think I'll take the Monday pill for Thursdays. Hmm. See, this is the kind of madness, but this is the system, you see. And I think you know that well, dear listener. So, this whole notion of people testifying, people who allowed, people who are part of a system that knew of Derek Chauvin's violence prior to this. New York Times, again, I've got to actually give them a little bit of, uh, of love today, as I have already in this episode. They did an article on this from last September about the fact that Derek Chauvin had used neck restraints before. Neck restraints. I call them knees to the neck. He had done this before. What if the jury had heard that? They would have deliberated for five minutes. This guy, I told you, he's had an 18 or 19 year career and he's had 17 or 18 or 19 complaints. He shot somebody or killed somebody previously. But to isolate this guy for the sake of trial is one thing, but to isolate him from the system, well, not only is that quite another thing, it's flatly dishonest and it allows the system to continue to do what it does to black people. And that is to kill us. Oh, the system, don't you just love? This is the thing, uh, you know, the system. It's... You know, I I can look at some other headlines. Washington police officer, and I believe that's Washington State. Washington police officer charged with murdering man outside grocery store dated August 20th, 2020. These are headlines from the New York Times from from the last six or seven or eight months. Two Indianapolis police officers charged with assaulting protesters August 12th, 2020, right? Three Mississippi police officers charged with murder of black man, August 14th, 2020. These are all headlines from the New York Times. And you you just think about January 6th, 2021 and the terrorist attack on the United States Capitol building. And none of those white males, terrorists, were killed. None of them. Now, there was Ashley Babbitt, who was part of that group a white female who was killed as she was climbing over to get inside the house uh, chamber. Right? Where? But all of the people who did violent things never got touched. And we're still trying to sort out, they're still trying to sort out who did what. But this is all systemic. This isn't just about a few so-called bad apples. The system is full is the bad apple. And the system designed the way it is to do what it's doing. I don't want to hear people, I've said this before, I don't want to hear people saying how broken the system is. It ain't broken. It's broken for us as black people because for us, we're getting shot every day and getting killed every day. There's Makia Bryant's. And there's George Floyd's and there's Breonna Taylor's and Rakia Boyd's and Adam Toledo's. For brown people, you know, on a daily basis, right? There's someone like 
the brother who got killed yesterday in Elizabeth City, North Carolina, Andrew Brown, he gets killed. Eight shot eight times as he's driving off. Where's the backup? Haven't you heard of backup? Oh, no, we don't do backup. We're too lazy. We're just going to kill him. Rayshard Brooks says, oh, we don't want backup. He's got my taser and he's running away from me. We're going to just kill him. And then stand on his shoulder as he dies on the side, on the street, on the parking lot, in the Wendy's parking lot. We're just going to stand on his shoulder. We're not going to render any aid to him. We're not going to render any aid. We're going to stand on his shoulder as he is lying, breathing his last breaths. We're not going to try to save his life. We're going to have our knee in George Floyd's neck for nine and a half minutes. And we're going to still keep it on there even after George Floyd has died. We need to keep the pressure on, folks. We've got to keep the pressure on these cases. We've got to keep the pressure on with this sentencing. You have got to make your voice heard. I want you to write to Amy Klobuchar, the senator there. I want you to write to the other senator there, Tina Smith. I want you to write to those prosecutors. I want you, you in the district attorney's office in Minneapolis. I, I want you to write to Keith Ellison's office, the attorney general of the state of Minnesota. I want you, it's going to be in the newsletter, which I promise will be available today, Thursday. It's been about two or three or four days since the last one, which I think was, was Sunday was the last one I did um, that's come out. But the, the next one I promise will be today, finally, after a hiatus. But... I'm going to put all of these things, these uh, links to the places where you need to be writing to or you need to be calling and you need to be putting pressure. I'm telling you this. See all this celebrating that some people are doing and the media exalting it. Ooh, this is a new day and all this nonsense. And some of these politicians talking nonsense. Talking nonsense, man. We need to stop exalting and celebrating and we need to get off our duffs and we need to start putting pressure on these people that I've just named. We need to put pressure on the locals there, meaning the, the mayor of Minneapolis, uh, Jacob Fry. I know that he and um, the George Floyd's, George Floyd's family uh, had this $27 million settlement negotiation so that the family gets that money. But I'm telling you, we need to pressure him. We need to get on top of all of it. I know it's the sentencing judge who makes the final decision and we can't pressure that person. I mean, we could, but I don't think there's a way to contact whoever that judge is, whether it's going to be Bruce Cahill or not. I don't know. I don't know if Bruce Cahill's elected or not or if he's appointed or not. And I'm guaranteeing you, there's not going to be any access to him. And I wouldn't want to have access to him, by the way. I mean, I personally wouldn't. I don't know about you. But it's not about threatening a judge, because I'm not for any of that. You know, and if you are, you need to knock it off. Not you personally, dear listener, because I don't think you are. But if anybody listening to this who doesn't is not a regular listener, somehow has a notion that you're going to start threatening people, please, don't do this. Don't do it. Just pack that. Pack it in. Pack it in. Pack that in. Put an end to that nonsense. That's not the answer. We have to have constructive engagement, but we also have to be out and present. Don't give these people an excuse. There are so many channels and avenues. Join an organization. Join an activist group. There's a great group among many others called Until Freedom, as in the word until and freedom. Until Freedom. Really good organization. Tamika Mallory. And a number of others who do Linda Sarsour, who do great work. 
Really important work. Support them. I'll put a link to them in the newsletter. Support them. If you don't know what to do, ask them, okay, what do I do? What can I do? How can I help? Because you can't just go back to business as usual and read everything, believe everything, believe everything, if I can speak, that you read and then not do anything. You can't rest in the knowledge that, oh yes, George Floyd's family got a guilty verdict and then go back to sleep like everything is okay. It's not. It's one verdict. And thankfully, the jury saw the humanity of George Floyd and saw our humanity as black people. Thankfully, that happened. And I was saying to you forever and ever that, yes, the prosecution obviously had to prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt, and that was going to be difficult to do, even with a case that was so clearly obvious to all of us. And on its face, objectively, it's so obvious, the video. But in the courtroom, it's another story. So many times I played you what Denzel Washington said in training day. It's not what you know. It's what you can prove. And that's so damn true. I don't even think training day was that great a movie. It really wasn't in my view. But Denzel was really good in it. And that line is one of the best lines in the movie. Everybody talks about the... uh, King Kong line, shoe program, 24-hour lockdown. I, I, Yeah, everyone loves that line, right? I'm going to be taking out cases on all you, you know, all that. They love that line, right? If you've seen Training Day, that line in that movie, you love, right? That's the one that defines that performance for many people. For me, it's the quieter moments that Denzel has in that movie as this corrupt, criminal-ass, kill a cop, right? And he says that moment, it's not what you know, it's what you can prove. And it's true. And thankfully, the white jurors saw the humanity of black people. Those were six white jurors out of a total of 12 jurors, four black people, two identify themselves as quote unquote mixed race, right? And I'm not belittling that. When I say quote unquote, I'm just saying that to you. I'm not editorializing anything. I'm just saying that. What they identify themselves as. So, I mean, this is the story. So, my whole thing is that even with all of the things that we know, it's got to be proven in a court of law. You don't just go back to those days, and I'm sure some people would love to, where you just take someone out of a jail cell and murder them, like they did to us, like they still do, I guess, to us in some place. I bet you there's still places where that happens to black people. So, you know, it happens in parts of the world where people, I mean, it's just, this is not stopped. It's not stopped. It's not about history repeating or, or not repeating. It's continuous. It, it's continuous. And uh, let's, let's um, make no mistake about that. Make no mistake about it. And, you know, that's the thing. We have really got to get ourselves into the mode of activism. Again, identifying issues that mean something to you and put this one on your list. There's no reason why Makia Bryant shouldn't still be here. She should still be here. Anthony Brown, excuse me, Andrew Brown should still be here, right? Dante Wright should still be, Sandra Sandra Bland and Breonna Taylor, they all should still be here. Adam Toledo should still be here, 13 years old. Tamir Rice, 12 years old, should still be here. We really need to start being more humane. We really do. And put pressure on these entities Because this sentencing of Derek Chauvin in June, it's during the summer. And you know what happens to us in the summer. We are on the beach. Well, we need to be on the streets. Or, at the very least, we need to be writing either letters, emails, tweets, whatever it is, to these entities that I've been telling you about. 
We need to be putting pressure on them. We need to be making phone calls. This is how you get a modicum of something out of this brutal system is when you keep fighting it and keep putting demands on it and you get in the street and protest. We wouldn't have had the Voting Rights Act, the Civil Rights Act, without people being in the street. And when I see ignoramuses, again, on these social media platforms, and they're put there to spread ignorance, not the platforms necessarily, but some of the trolls on them. They are hired by people, in some cases, to spread ignorance, to get people distracted. So when some idiot says, oh, marches don't do anything, protests don't do anything, Well, that person's fundamentally dishonest and they are a troll. Because none of these things would have been achieved in this country without protest, without civil disobedience, without people putting themselves on the line, without people being killed, people who really did make a sacrifice. Not for justice, but for a cause where people should be treated equally. And there's a difference between that and what Speaker Pelosi said. Because George Floyd was not at a rally for Black Lives Matter when he was murdered. George Floyd was not registering people to vote, right, when he was murdered. George Floyd was not driving, right, from a rally when he was murdered. George Floyd was not in the street protesting when he was murdered. He was living his life like all of us do, just doing things in our lives that you don't even think about. You walk to a grocery store. You don't think about some cop coming up and murdering you. Now, there are people out here who died in service of fighting for something, like a Heather Heyer, like a Viola Luzo, like a Jimmy Lee Jackson, like a James Reeb, like a James Cheney, like an Andrew Goodman, like a Mickey Schwerner. Come on. This is that that that's what those people did. And, and the days that they were, the day that they died, the day that they were killed, they were dying, fighting for justice. Those are the kinds of people that you salute. You don't thank them for dying for justice, but you just say to them, "Thank you for your courage. Thank you for the person that you were. I'm so sorry for your loss." But you were someone who believed in everybody being free and getting the same kind of treatment under the law. And those people were dying while trying to make the world a better place. And you don't even thank them for anything like that. You just say to the families, I'm so sorry for your loss. Your daughter or your son was... Someone who believed in the best in this world and tried to make it a better place. That's all you have to say. You don't have to be talking about thanking people for dying for justice. It's just you just don't have a clue, do you? Right? It's not how that's not how you do that. I'll be right back. Well, you know, um, Don uh, Lemon and I are dear, dear friends, and we've been dear friends for a long time. Uh, And dear friends oftentimes disagree. And Don is wrong here. Uh, You know, my my question is, you know, why is Deadly Forest always the first order of business? And especially the first order of business when it comes to uh, black and brown people in this country. Her, Let's compare apples to apples. Let's compare this uh, young girl. 16 or uh, 16 years old or 17 years old to other 17 year olds. Let's compare her to Kyle Rittenhouse. 
Video was taken 15 minutes before Rittenhouse allegedly shot and killed two people. You know what officers did? He was carrying an assault weapon. Uh, the video shows the police shared water with him and thanked him for uh, uh, his presence. Also, after the shooting, he was able to leave the scene. Even though caught on video, he walked towards police with his hands up as protesters yelled that he had shot people. Let's also compare him to the Atlanta shooter, Robert Aaron Long. He was taken into custody without incident. And you know what the officer said that arrested him? The captain, that he was having a really bad day. How about comparing him to Dylan Roof? In June of 2015, he killed nine churchgoers. He was treated so kindly by police that he was taken to a Burger King. So was de-escalation okay. a possibility so here in this case? Not with this black girl, not at all. Well said, Sonny Hostin. That was Sonny Hostin, the attorney, legal analyst, and panelist on The View from this day, Tuesday, here, from Thursday, today, Thursday, April 22nd, 2021. And she says what I have said, what many people have said, what I suspect perhaps you have said. Why is deadly for theft? I think I've said it even on this particular episode specifically. I said it yesterday for sure and other times. Why is deadly force always the first order of business? Why is that the first resort? I've certainly been saying that to people um, I have conversations with. When it comes to us as black people and brown people, why is it? I mean, deadly force is always the first thing. I think I mentioned it earlier in this episode. Oh, you know, the best way to resolve this, you know, resolve a dispute is to blow someone away. That's the culture of the United States of America, is that if you watch Dirty Harry, the movie Dirty Harry, 1971, if you watch that movie, if you watch all of these movies with Clint Eastwood, even before Dirty Harry, the good, the bad, the ugly, and all these other, you know, Sergio Leone Western, I get it. But the point is, is that you watch all these movies, it's not just Clint Eastwood, it's John Wayne, it's Gary Cooper, it's, you know, it's, you know, gun crazy. Great movie, by the way, Peggy Cummins. I mean, great movie. But, again, the culture. The culture is shoot quest, shoot first, and when it comes to black folks, shoot, shoot first. And never ask questions. Not ask questions later. Never ask questions. Until the activists get in the street. And compel you to ask questions. That's the only time the questions ever get asked. Is because you and I get in the street. Or people out there who are activists. Who devote their lives to doing this. Get in the street. And force the questions to start to be asked. And raise the questions. And force the people in power to ask the questions and do something. It's the system. Again, it goes on with what I've been saying in this episode. There is a system in place. No one is training. There's no training manual that's written down that says murder black people. This is by practice. You've even got people, as I've told you before, police in Cobb County, Georgia, pulling over a white woman this was five years ago now, July 2016, telling her, don't worry, I see you're nervous, but don't worry, we only shoot black people. Remember? Remember? We only shoot black people. We only kill black people. Seriously. Quote, remember, we only kill black people, end quote. That's exactly what a police officer, I think he was a sheriff or something, whatever, said to a white woman late at night when she got pulled over by the cops in Cobb County, Georgia. I believe that cop got fired, but I'm not sure. But this is the issue, right? This is the thing. It's a system that does this. And it's not just Derek Chauvin. And we don't know if he's going to get 10 years, 12 years, 60 years. But I tell you what, the United States Supreme Court today, in its infinite, infinite, infinite non-wisdom, Rule 6-3, to three, that 
Sentencing courts and sentencing judges and sentences do not have to look at whether there are any permanent incorrigibility factors, whether this person is beyond all rehabilitational hope, whether they are beyond any kind of thing because they're so irredeemable before sentencing someone to life without parole who is under the age of 18. So the Supreme Court, speaking of systems, has ruled today, dear listener, in a case called Jones versus Mississippi, that if you are a juvenile and you've been convicted of a crime, heinous crime, and you are sentenced and you are facing sentencing, the person who is sentencing you does not have to look at whether or not you as a juvenile have this irredeemable quality of evil in you, for example, this permanent incorrigibility. They can just sentence you to life without parole. They don't need any reasons. As a juvenile, is that the message? Is that the society we want? And it's this very militaristic society. Horrible decision by the Supreme Court that was. Jones versus Mississippi. It's a terrible decision. So if some juvenile commits a a heinous crime and you're looking at the sentencing, you're not looking at any factors. You can just sentence that person to life without parole. No aggravate. You're not going to look at any of the factors. You're just going to throw them. Really? That's what we want? But this is what you have when you've got a six to three court. When you've got six arch conservatives. John Roberts is an arch conservative. He may not be as conservative as Scalia. Well, Scalia is no longer here. As Alito and Thomas and Amy Coney Barrett and Kavanaugh. And the other conservative on there. But he's conservative. Six to three. And the three obviously were Sotomayor, right? Breyer, right? And Kagan. Those are the only three so-called liberal, I hate that word, so-called left-leaning judges, right? Those three, and it was 6-3. Sotomayor's dissent is incredible. I'll get to that, I think, tomorrow. Because it deserves a separate... That, that, well, you've got to read that dissent. But this is part of a system. It's part of the same system that Sonny Hostin was talking about in that audio you just heard on The View today. And she was speaking to Whoopi Goldberg. And was saying she disagrees with Don Lemon. And hey, it won't be the first time you disagree with him. I mean, no one disagrees with him more than I do. Well, that's not true, actually. That's not true. He's he, he gets it right a lot of the time, but there's times where he doesn't. Like all of us, like myself, like you, like all of us, right? But Sonny Hostin's correct. And she lays out in that clip what... I've been saying, I said it in yesterday's episode about Kyle Rittenhouse getting ready, walking free. And he actually, and what Sonny did not say in that clip is that he actually said, I've just killed two people. He can be heard on that video shouting that he's just killed two people. That's why his hands are up. So he's surrendering and the police let him go. I mentioned that in yesterday's episode. I mentioned the Burger King with Dylan Roof. It's as if, Sonny Hostin listened to me. I know she didn't, most likely. But you don't have to listen to this podcast to know this. Sonny Hostin is well aware of these events and facts. So, I mean, I don't want to stop. <laughs> but you know what I mean. Sonny Hostin knows this. She's a person in the world like you are, like I am, like we are. And people like you and I are looking at the world around us. If you listen to this podcast, then you and me are people who 
take stock of what's going on around us, right? It's not only about us. It's about the world we live in also, right? Most importantly. And the society that we are a part of or that we're trying to be activist against in terms of the injustices and the evils of it, right? So Sonny Hostin knows these facts and she laid them out as perfectly as you could expect. Robert Aaron Long, that's the one person I didn't mention yesterday. That's right. And I played the audio of that when it happened, when that police chief or sergeant said, the, from Cherokee County said, oh, he was having a difficult day and he had these aggressions and he had a sex addiction, addiction problem and he just felt that this was the best way for him to, to address that. I'm paraphrasing, but that's pretty much what this guy said in front of a press conference. Police chief, police uh, captain or whatever he was of Cherokee County. Andy, whatever his last name was. Disgraceful. But you see how the, mis- the excuses get made for these white killers, white male killers. And she didn't mention Patrick Crucis. Patrick Crucis, who murdered 20 plus people, 23, 24, 26 people, however many in, in people, brown people in El Paso, in Texas. And they just incidentally arrested him. They weren't, there wasn't this all all uh, APB for him and they just happened to see this car parked and they looked into it and there he was with his guns police I think they cornered him on the street or something. it wasn't some dramatic thing and they didn't you're under arrest so step out of the vehicle boom it was done right they didn't shoot him they didn't say show me your hands they just handcuffed him and away we go So this isn't about some training. I I really cringe with these politicians, black, white, and otherwise, say, oh, it's about training. We need to retrain. It's not about the training. It's about the system. And you know know that as a politician, but you know that you can't say that because the minute you start talking like that, you're starting to look over your shoulder. You're starting to be like king in the wilderness. Please see that documentary on Netflix or wherever it may be. I think it's on YouTube called King in the Wilderness. The last year and a half to two years of Dr. King's life. Please watch that and remind yourself of how much King was hated in this country and how much as a human being he feared for his life. That never really gets talked about every January 20th now, does it? It's all of this mythical, hagiographical thing that gets talked about Dr. King. But you don't treat him as a human being, do you? You treat him like some mythical angel. And some people may see him that way. But I don't. He's a human being. He's a person of conscience. He had feelings. He had frailties. He had flaws. He had great things about him. He cared about the world that he lived in. And he wanted to do something about it. And he wanted to change it for the better. And to make sure that black people lived in a world that treated them better. So that you wouldn't have cops in Birmingham putting their knees in 1963 on the necks of black women. Way before George Floyd. So you wouldn't have four little girls blown to bits in 1963 in Birmingham, Alabama. Breonna Taylor, 50 some odd years later, 60, almost 60 years later, Breonna Taylor, Dante Wright, Makia Bryant, Andrew Brown, Adam Toledo. So it's the names like, you know, Pam Turner from 2019, pregnant black woman shot dead by this cop. This is a system and this is the thing. This is a system and that needs to go. The system needs to go. 
It's a well-oiled killing machine, as I said last week. It's got to go. It just has to. It's not about training anybody. Ooh, sensitivity training. You can't have sensitivity training when the system is insensitive. You can't have sensitivity training when the system that produces that training is a hostile, insensitive, unjust, violent system. How do those things coexist together? How do you have a system like that and expect it to function in a way that helps and benefits black people, brown people? The whole system's got to go. And people get offended by defund the police or abolish the police. Heck, I've become all in favor of that because the police are murdering us out here. And it ain't just about, well, it's just this group of bad cops. It's a system that allows those cops to go from one department to another. It's the system that allows for a Derek Chauvin to stay on the force. 19 complaints. Where he's used the same knee on the neck before to other people. Other black people specifically. Brown people. He's killed, he's killed or shot some one before. Oh, well, that's part of the job. No, it's not part of the job when you've got this guy doing this over and over and he continues on. That's the system. Most cops never even pull out their gun in their whole careers. But you've got to have a system where the cops who kill are sent to prison. And if they aren't indicted, they never are a cop again. They've got to lose their pension. They've, there's got to be an end to this qualified immunity nonsense. They, they cannot be immune from anything. They've got to be sued in person and lose their pensions and lose their monies. And that's what's got to happen. And then you've got to have a system that makes clear that it does care and it shows that by the kinds of laws and by the kinds of opportunities that are offered to people who are black and brown. So we don't have to be fixing this on the back end. And you have to pay out millions of dollars to families. That's not what we want anymore. We don't want to have to have settlements of cases because people have been murdered. We don't want the murders to begin with, is my point. And we need to have a system in place that is not the system we've got now. Because it ain't working for the people getting murdered out here on these streets by cops. And yes, there are people every day in communities that get affected by violence. Black, white, all kinds. But I'm telling you, for the most part, those folks go to jail. They go to prison. Now, of course, if you're a domestically violent spouse... You might not go anywhere. The police might look at you and go, okay, sir, I see there's nothing wrong here. Your wife seems fine. A couple of bruises on the side of her face. And, you know, she's clearly been crying for the last four hours. And there's a bloody lip and some scratches on her neck and marks around her neck and red marks as if, or bruising. And, but everything looks fine here. Have a good night, sir. And they drive off. And then the abuse continues. And see, that's the thing that doesn't get talked about, right? And this is going on in white communities all over this country. Oh, black on... That's not white on white violence. And it's a very serious problem. I, I do not make light of domestic violence. But I'm telling you, it's the way that we are trained to think in this country about the way violence happens. And our responses to it and how we think of it and about it. We have to do better. We have to. The question is, do we want to? And do we want to get rid of a system and have a different one? One that from the start 
makes it clear to black people and to white people that black girls are precious, that black women are precious, that they must be respected like any human being and that black boys are precious and must be respected and have the iconography, not just of a culture, but of these corporations who don't just put black people in their commercials, but hire them in front office positions that give black folk ownership of companies, of business, of franchises, more than what there are now. Visibility, inclusion. And you're not just putting a black person on TV on a Saturday or a Sunday for the news. And your education system cares about the black people that you aspire to educate. And that you have more black teachers and black female teachers in particular in these schools all over the country. And not these white male or white female teachers, some of whom don't give a rat's you know what about those black children. I've read article after article after article about some white female teacher or some white male teacher who is berating these kids. I personally know of a white female teacher who told me, oh, I can't deal with these. I can't deal with these kids. I said to her, so where do you where do you teach? Oh, I teach in this neighborhood. This meaning I'm not naming the neighborhood. Clearly a neighborhood that is black and brown. Oh, and I just can't deal with it. I can't stand. Okay, so where where do you live? Oh, I live in, and it's clearly a mostly white neighborhood that she lives in. And I'm saying, so hold on one second. What is it that you can't deal with? These are children. Oh, well, you know, they're, they're, they're antsy and they're, why do you think that is? And then she can't answer me. I wish they would just be not so antsy. And it's like, okay, so why do you think they're antsy? If that's true, why do you think some of those kids are antsy? Did you ask them whether they ate something before they came to your class? Did you ask them what kind of night they had the night before? Did you ask them if there was something going on in their family? Did you ask them if they got enough sleep last night? And I'm telling you, if you've got a a white teacher who has a mindset of they are so antsy, and you and your whole thing is about control and behavior modification, that kind of term, that kind of garbage, racist garbage. But that's what they, these people do, some of them. They don't see those children as children who want to learn. They see them as, oh, if I can just control them and stop them from excessively moving around in their chairs, then I've done my job. There is a, there's a, there's a, there's a percentage of teachers who are not black, who approach it that way. And then there's some, a percentage of teachers who are not black who actually do teach and do a damn good job. But I want to see more black women in teaching positions. And that's what we need more of too. Short of homeschooling your child. I want to see that. I want to see more black women in particular. And black men, but in particular black women. Teaching these kids. And there's many, but I want to see more. So that we have a system where there are people who are clearly invested in these kids. And I would dare say that the vast majority of black teachers are. But I'm not so sure about some teachers who aren't black. I'm not so sure about some of these white teachers. Some of them are invested And then there's a cross-section of them who are. There was a teacher about maybe four years ago now 
who was a clearly linked with the Klan and clearly linked with these white racist groups. And she had her own blog that was dedicated to racist white people and how she was saying all these racist things on her blog. And she's teaching some kids, some black kids. She didn't, she didn't be teaching any kids at all. Black, white, Asian, no matter what they are. Brown kids. She shouldn't be teaching in th- to begin with. She's clearly teaching hate. And then she's going to school. And going into class. And then saying these things in class. That's not just teachers being racist. As horrible as that is. That's part of a system that allows teachers like that to be where they are. And then a black teacher who's got all the potential, all the promise and all the experience ain't getting a chance. Teaching is still very white in this country. It remains so in the schools. Very white. Academia. In the United States of America, still in 2021, is still very, very vanilla. Very white. Overwhelmingly so. The people that you see on television who are black in academia academia, are the exception that prove the rule. Honestly. Thank you very much for listening to this edition of The Politocrat. I'm Omar Moore.